products used to come in boxes. When Silicon Valley started, when you started a company, you ordered your computer with Intel inside, it came in a box. You ordered your database from Oracle, it came in a box. And when people were developing these products, naturally, there was a time for the engineers, the product managers, the designers to conceive, design, build this product. And then there was a line in the sand, the ship date, where product was handed over to sales and marketing so that it could be distributed. So naturally, when hardware became software, we tried to reproduce that line in the sand. And that's when I started my career in Silicon Valley. I joined Siebel Systems, one of the leaders in customer relationship management, CRM. So when you, had, when you, when you bought Siebel Systems, you got a box. Just like, by the way, when we get our music back then, we get a box, we get a CD. When we get our movies, we get a box, we get a DVD. And there was this notion of the ship date. Now, that all got disrupted when product moved to the cloud. And I was there when Salesforce disrupted Siebel Systems. In fact, it happened at our user conference. We had thousands of our customers gathered at a big event here in Silicon Valley. And Salesforce hired dozens of rollerbladers sporting t-shirt that said, no software. Now, don't get me wrong, Salesforce is a software company. But because the product didn't come in a box, because it was in the cloud, it wasn't really software. That said, that notion of ship date was very reassuring for product builders. And so we invented this idea of product market fit. Product market fit being there's a time to develop products, and then there's a time to sell it. But when product is in the cloud, Product market fit doesn't exist because product constantly gets updated and reinvented. And so this idea of product market fit has become a myth. And instead, if we can move to the next slide, or if I can, yes, thank you, uh, the slide before. And instead, there are 50 shades of product market fit. 50 shades of product market fit, which means that we no longer know what makes a great product, or rather we're looking for the answer to what makes a great product. And that's what I started to, um, that, that's what I set out to answer eight years ago when I started an organization called Products That Count, which today reaches over 300,000 product managers. That's about 20% of all product managers. We were asking what makes a great product. Intuitively, we all know what makes a great product. If we look at Uber, for example, we know that we don't have to think anymore. We don't have to plan. We don't have to stop on the side of the road to look at the map. We don't have to pay the taxi cab. We just get in and we get out. That's a great product. But it's much harder when we go under the hood to try and define it. So we formed an advisory board two years into this journey and asked them, and we've done that every year since, what makes a great product manager? What are the superpower or the people who create products and keep them great iteration after iteration? And we, we came, uh, they, they came back every year with different answers, but there was one common denominator, which is that great product managers have a growth mindset. They are able, time after time, to reinvent their product, to keep intellectual curiosity and keep iterating and making their products great. And we thought, well, where, where are these people? Where do we find them? They flock together because it's really hard in corporate America, whether it's Silicon Valley or elsewhere, to find people who want to constantly reinvent themselves. So they joined companies that build great product teams. So two years ago, we formed a partnership with Capgemini to understand the characteristics of these great chief product officers. In fact, the, the, the title itself was a bit novel because only 15% of Fortune 1000 companies have a chief product officer. And we analyzed the great characteristics of the best chief product officers and found out that there are three. 
The first one being they have to not only build great products, but grow them and align internal organizations behind them. Second, they also have to think about KPIs, but have a lot of soft skills. So they have to have left and right brain. And then third, they have to have great control. Their work is more successful when they have responsibility of product, design, engineering, and marketing team, as opposed to only product and design. In fact, 3.5 more, 3.5 times more successful. And then we thought, like, where do these people go to work? They work for the companies of the future, the companies that are led by product first CEOs. And today at Mighty Capital, that's what we invest in, product first CEOs. So we looked at what are the characteristics of these product first CEOs. And there are a few. Uh, the first one is they demand ROI. They don't just build technology for the sake of technology. They expect that product is going to have a direct impact on the top KPIs of the organization. So from a CEO standpoint, they have to drive revenue or improve productivity or reduce costs. And they do that by, for example, leveraging tools to drive revenue tools like product like growth tool, like one of our portfolio companies, Amplitude, that competes directly against Google, so Google Analytics, so a free product with infinite distribution. And this is a company that was able to go public last year with a paid product because they have a better product that accelerates customer revenue. To improve productivity, take Slack, uh, an example from here from Silicon Valley, that enables productivity even during a pandemic. And then to reduce cost, we've seen an explosion in tools that we call low code and no code that basically enable to create software without engineering teams. So that reduces the cost of building really expensive engineering teams. Now, I mentioned three tools, the last one being Sorcero in the life science field. Uh, but there are 4,000 tools today that empower that new product function. And that's a thousand more than the 3,000 that got nominated for our product award last year. And, and another thousand more than the 2,000 that got nominated in 2021. Compare that with marketing tools, tools that empower the marketing organization. Today, there are 10,000 of them. And I predict that in five years, there will be 10,000 tools supporting product driving ROI. Now, Product first CEO also expect their product leaders, their chief product officers to drive business strategy. And why is that? Well, just like us, when we want to build a house, we're going to pick an architect to listen to what we need to design the house. And then we're going to trust this architect to identify a general contractor to build the house. Well, a product first CEO does the same thing rather than what most CEOs do, which is hire a bunch of engineers and hope they build a great product. They hire a great product manager or chief product officer and, and let them build a great product and then delegate the execution of building this product to a chief product officer. The other thing that we learned product first CEOs do is they also uh, reinvent their go to market playbook. 20 years ago, when I started my career at Siebel, we were selling to the CIO, Chief Information Officer, or CTO, Chief Technology Officer. And once we had gone that route, we had to get the buy-in from business, which means we had to go outside the organization and go try to convince a Chief Marketing Officer or a Chief HR Officer that what IT wanted was right. And most of the time, we failed because these organizations from the inside didn't get along. Pre-pandemic, the go-to-market in enterprises was the same except reverse. You had to go to the chief business officer first, and then from the outside of the organization, if we go to the next slide, you could, um, you, you could try to convince IT to, to also green light your product. What we see post-pandemic is that these product-first CEO, they go and try to identify a champion inside the product organization 
that will then navigate and sell their product for them because the product managers already work with all these organizations to ship product. And so they turn these product managers into a champion and then they equip the product managers with whatever they need to sell internally. And that whatever they need really comes down to product managers, what kind of products are they looking for, which is great products. Right? So again, product first CEO, building a great product, leveraging product managers as champion for their sales process, which means that essentially great products end up selling themselves. And if you look at Dropbox, very simple example, if I want to share a file with you on Dropbox, I just have to upload it, share it with you, you create a free account on Dropbox, and now if I'm the product manager who built Dropbox, instead of having one user, I have a hundred. And the more we share products uh, on Dropbox with one another, the more we each own specific files. And at some point, Dropbox naturally will say, well, you have enough files that we'd like you to pay us. And so these users turn into customers, right? So the product like Dropbox sells itself. Now, there's a lot of companies we see right now in Silicon Valley leverage that motion and try to in uh, enable what we call product-led growth. And it's only possible when you have a product like Dropbox, right? You have to have that embedded network effect and you have to have the stickiness of a file that you want to hold on to. Now, I've talked about hiring great product managers, chief product officers, selling, but I want to leave you with the key thing that product first CEOs do, which is they build products that eventually make us better people. And that's the key learning that I've really taken away from literally thousands or probably tens of thousands by now of conversations with amazing product managers, which is our technology has become an extension of ourselves. And so if we want to build great products, we have to think about what makes a great person. And I use the mind, body, spirit framework to describe that starting with body. We all want to look good. We all want to uh, expect actually that our technology will also be beautiful. But beauty in technology is not about pretty pictures. In fact, when you look uh, in a slightly more philosophical way at the definition of beauty, it has to do with uh, a, an efficiency factor. In fact, there's a, a philosopher that says beauty equals order over chaos. It's bringing order out of chaos. So it's about efficiency. And then it's also about this wow factor that we all know here with the, the products that uh, companies like Apple are shipping. Now, if we look at the, the mind rule, uh, the, the sp sorry, the spirit rule, uh, we want products to be very meaningful. And meaning in technology means we want our products to be highly personalized. And at the same time, because they're personalized and they know so much about ourselves, we also expect that they're going to be maintaining our privacy. And then lastly, the mind rule is about learning. We're all here because we love to learn. And we expect that our technology will also learn with us. And they learn incrementally and they learn disruptively, but that's the expectation. So these are some of the characteristics that we see that will, in my opinion, shape the future of great products led by uh, CEOs who build product-first companies. Thank you.